Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Really happy to be here at the first Open Mainframe Summit. Uh, my name is Javier Perez, and I'm uh, Open Source uh, Program Manager for IBM. I'm part of the IBM Z organization. Uh, and I'm here to talk about open source software security. Uh, we have a good title here, Beyond the Mainframe Security Features. It's time to learn about open source software security. And for the next 25 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about all the details around open source. Uh, as we grow, uh, the industry keeps moving into open source. Um, you know, it's just natural to have more and more open source software in the mainframe. So I think it's an important uh, uh, topic to talk about security beyond all those security features that uh, you will know uh, we have on the mainframe. And I've just, just mentioned uh, briefly. So without further ado, I'm going to uh, start the presentation. So it's all about open source, right? It's all about uh, all the innovations that are out there. You know, you name it, right? You see on the images there, augmented reality, virtual reality, autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles, AI, machine learning, deep learning, blockchain, virtual assistants, all of that and more, all those innovations are being built on the open. Right. I mean, you can just go to the GitHub repo or any other Git public repo and, and look at the code to see exactly how it's been done. Uh, and that's the that's the beauty about open source, right? The communities, more people contribute, there's there's engagement and it's growing, right? It keeps it, it grows in terms of the enhancements, new functionality, and at the same time addressing the box and addressing uh, security issues. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here. But but it, it's very clear that open source is mainstream. Open source is here to stay. I mean, look at all those programming languages, right, and frameworks. They're all open source. All your developers, if you are a developer, you are using open source, right? And there, there are actually millions of libraries out there, so you don't have to start from scratch. You just go, you need something to encrypt. There's a library or actually many libraries out there that, that, that do the job for you. And you know, depending on the study, uh, there's between 70 to 99 percent of of the, the applications, the software that is built today, that it's actually contained in open source. So 70 to 99 percent of the code, it's actually already open source, and we're just reusing and, and innovating and building uh, new functionality. And that's and that's and that's a good thing about open source, right? Um, in the enterprises, in the businesses. Uh, you are seeing it more and more. Uh, even if you are just focusing on the on the mainframe uh, space, you see that that open source is taking uh, taking off just because of it's it's the low cost to start, right? It's free, it's available, and as I just mentioned, uh, most of the innovations uh, or all the innovations are on the open, right? When we talk about uh, machine learning, for example, you know, every all these libraries from Python or, or Tensor TensorFlow. They're all out there, and you want to use the latest and greatest uh, Qflow. And I, mean, I can go on and on in terms of uh, uh, open source projects. Many of them part of this uh, um, umbrella of uh, Linux Foundation, and 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 that's where you you, know, you want to keep innovating. You want to use those that uh, that functionality that is already available there. So it's it's a great advantage for the businesses. It's a great advantage for for the enterprises. Uh, a couple of other points that are are important is. You know, there's a faster pace, especially on those successful projects. There's a faster pace of bug fixing and vulnerability fixes. You know, and I'm going to talk about the security uh, uh, security in just a second. But uh, you see more people participating, more people addressing any issues, right? And you know, something that didn't happen a few years ago. Uh, you know, there's actually more, more and more documentations. There are forums, there are community forums, there are videos, there are blog posts. There's so much content out there. Uh, with the participation of many businesses, many enterprises, so there's more su so much support on on open source software that it's a really viable uh, way to start on the businesses. And and by the way, you know it also helps with your recruiting. You know you want to recruit good developers, you want to recruit old stack developers. That's what they're doing. That's what they're learning. They're reducing all the latest open source uh, software. So it's also uh, another reason to to adopt open source software. If we could move into the mainframes, um, and actually recently just uh, published an article at the IBM uh, uh, Systems Magazine 
you can you can you can get a little bit more detail on that. And and we are um, you know within five actually just 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 have the five year anniversary of Linux One. Uh, actually, together with uh, five years with the for the Open Mainframe uh, uh, project, which congratulations, that's that's great. Uh, a lot of things have happened in five years, right? But there's open source. There's always been open source on the mainframes. I mean, Linux has been on the mainframes for more than 20 years now. And uh, as I said, there's 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 a blog post and there's more documentation out there about about that. And and I know that there's some initiatives to talk about the, the 20 years of Linux uh, and the mainframes. Uh, but now these are these are numbers, uh, very recent numbers from from IBM. Uh, we have more than 50 percent uh, of all mainframes running Linux. Uh, more than 90% of the larger enterprises that, that have a mainframe, they are now running Linux. Uh, pretty much all Linux distributions are available on mainframes, uh, commercial and, and uh, open source distributions. They're very much all, all available out there. And, and there's a, a large uh, or a growing ecosystem of open source software that is now available on, for mainframe platforms, what is known as the S390X architect, process architecture. And just to show you a, a quick example, here are a few logos. These are actually open source software, you know, popular or most recognizable software out there, but it's also available on the mainframes, right? So, so we have a growing ecosystem. And by the way, you can go to those links there if you want to take a picture or, or have access to the, the recording on the slides later, um, where you can find information um, on, on each one of these um, Open source uh, software, how to you know, including documentation. In some cases, uh, some scripts of of how to deploy or how to build it. Uh, but this is just a partial list. There there are more open source software that is available now um, on the mainframes. Now you know within the languages and runtimes, uh, you probably recognize there is Zoe, also part of the open source uh, project. Um, you know, there, there's also some growing space for ZOS, right? The mainframe operating system. Uh, most of this, obviously, is, uh, it's uh, it's Linux, but again, it's a growing ecosystem, uh, and this is fantastic, right? This is this is great. So now let's talk about open source software security, and and here I'm talking about not just the the kind of well known open source software that I just showed you on the previous slide, but I'm want to talk about when you are developing, when your developers are coding and they're building applications for, for the mainframe. Uh, when we talk about security, uh, we talk about vulnerabilities. Uh, it's, it's, it's all about vulnerabilities. And of course, when there's an exploit on those vulnerabilities. Um, those vulnerabilities happened on the open source libraries or components or, or packages. Uh, in reality, it's in a specific functionality of that library. Right, so we can say, well, this library has, uh, uh, you know, one vulnerability or two or three vulnerabilities, but in reality, uh, the vulnerability happened in a specific function or or what is called method of that library. So very important when when you you talk about vulnerabilities, what part of that library? What what's the vulnerable method or vulnerable function of that library? Um, the CVEs, the common vulnerability and exposures. That's when the um, Vulnerability is reported, it's disclosed, and uh, there's a, a number, there's basically an ID assigned to it, and a score, and that's the CVSS score system, uh, which goes from you know very high, high, medium, uh, low uh, severity. Uh, there's actually a couple of versions of CVSS, version two, version three, version three adds another severity, uh, and, and that's how you help you classify or rank or prioritize your, your vulnerabilities. And, and and the big issue here, one of the big areas is, you know, not every vulnerability is disclosed or is uh, um, available in the national vulnerability database or some other uh, public uh, repository. Uh, so there's an issue here where, especially with newer, more modern languages and with the speed of DevOps, that there's not really time to go and, and publish and disclose the information about the, the vulnerability. So. That's another uh, kind of important problem or important issue when we talk about uh, security for, for open source software. Uh, you have to go and find those vulnerabilities that are out there, right? There's all open source, open repos uh, that are out there. 
So why do vulnerabilities exist? And, and you know, there's always the question, right? I mean, you know, there are bad, uh, bad developers there or, or people that are trying to do uh, the bad things. It's not that. Uh, really, uh, a vulnerability exists on the software, especially on, on or any software, but I'm talking about open source software, uh, when there's not enough education about uh, security or development uh, security education. Uh, for example, uh, developers should know uh, at least the top 10 OWASP uh, type of uh, vulnerabilities. You know, things like cross-site scripting, things like injection of uh, SQL injection or non-SQL injection or LDAP injection, and, and on and on and on. So I recommend you to, uh, if, if this is new to you or to your developers, to go and check the OWASP and, and the different training that it's around security. This will go a long way in terms of reducing the number of uh, vulnerabilities on the on the code. Uh, and then there's there's the concept of a security champions. Uh, you know, not everyone is an expert. Nobody, not everybody knows a lot about uh, security. But if you have at least one person that knows more about security in the different teams, in your different Scrum teams, they can act as security champions and you know help with reuse or uh, or assist uh, in anything that that relates to potential uh, flaws or potential uh, opening for vulnerabilities. Uh, the other issue, and you know, a couple of other issues, is that it's there's no question is, to, in, especially in the successful projects, we have way too many contributors, right? And and I like to put there the that quote from from Linus Torvalds, which which I think is it's good and and, and captures the essence of open source, which is, uh, given enough, enough eyeballs, all box are shallow, right? And box or security uh, or vulnerabilities are are shallow, and and it, it how it works, and that, that's. You know, with participation, there's a bug, there's a fix, there's a vulnerability. People find go and find the fix, and that, that's great about the open source. Uh, but with so many contributors, uh, you sometimes you lose track, and and then sometimes you know unintentionally, someone with not enough security education can make it open for a vulnerability. And then the final point there, and and this is the best uh, picture I could find for for this, is the fact that especially for the large projects. Uh, there's not a single architecture, right? There, there's enhancements, there, there's new functionality, there's new subsystems, or there's new APIs. And then it gets a little bit of out of control in terms of a single unified architecture. So that, that creates uh, gaps, right, where potentially can be exploited potential vulnerabilities out there. Um, so let's talk quickly about the libraries. And obviously, I'm not referring to, to uh, bookshelves, but I'm talking about the open source libraries. And, and the, the, the point that I want to make here, really make here, is the fact that uh you know open source projects open source uses other open source and uses other open source right so uh you know there's a chain there's a chain you know one uh software can use another open source library that uses another open source library and go on on and on and on and on depending on the programming language in some cases it's worse than others and i'll show you a graph in just a second uh, about that and I know your developers use dependency management tools. They use package management tools to take care of all those dependencies. Sometimes it's a big problem when you're building or you're compiling your applications. Uh, but but you also have to look at the security side of things, right? So so these dependency management tools, these package management tools, are not really looking for vulnerabilities. They're looking to address your um, uh, your dependencies, right? Make sure everything works with the correct versions of your of your dependencies. I have a couple of examples for you, and I think this represents well this this increased risk, right? This this issue in terms of open source security. Uh, this is one of the most popular in Java. I, I use as a source Maven repository.com. Uh, you can go and check by yourselves and, and many other examples. Uh, the Apache Commons IO library. Uh, this library has uh, just just a few days ago had more than nineteen thousand artifacts that actually artifacts meaning libraries that use the Apache Commons I.O. library, right? So, so one library is used by more than 19,000 other libraries. One of them is Apache Commons LAN, which actually is also used by another 17,000 or more than 17,000 uh, libraries, or Skeltest that is used more than 12 times, or SpringWeb, or FastJSON, uh, or you know, Hadoop Common, or Selenium, and, and others. And the, that's just a sample, right? This is just, just to represent this on, 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 a, on a slide. Zookeeper and many others. Uh, there's a chain, right? So uh, if there's a vulnerability in one of these, let's say you're an Apache Commons IO or in one of these 
uh, kind of first line uh, uh, direct dependencies, um, then it's going to affect all the other usage, all the other open source libraries. Uh, and in some cases, you just know the library that you're calling, but you don't check the rest of the libraries that are being used by the library that you're calling your direct uh, dependency, right? Uh, here's another example. Uh, the previous was, was Java. This is JavaScript. Lodash, it's one of the most popular JavaScript libraries out there. And it was not 12,000. It's actually more than 100,000 uh, libraries use Lodash. Uh, by the way, uh, Lodash had a lot of high priority or a multiple high priority, high severity uh, vulnerabilities a few years ago. Um, pretty much in the last two, three years, it's it's been really, really good. But there was a one point where there were some, you know, high severity uh, uh, vulnerabilities, and it was affecting, you know, hundreds, actually thousands of other libraries. And you know, here's an example, and you might recognize some of these, like uh, Elasticsearch or, or Twilio and others that are actually using this Lodash package, and there are many, 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 many more. So, so what's the what's the situation here, right? Uh, there's always going to be new vulnerabilities. I had I hate to say it. I had to say it. I had to tell you. <laughs> you know, there's always new code. There's always the potential for new vulnerabilities. Uh, and and you know, there's constantly discovery of these vulnerabilities. Now, uh, the good thing I was telling you about you know the beauty of open source. The good thing is that the smart way to do it when developers go and find those vulnerabilities. They don't disclose that immediately. They go work on the fix, and once they have the fix, then there's a disclosure. Now, you, you, I know where, I, where I think you know where I'm going. Uh, okay, well, let's disclose. There's a fix, but now you have to go and update your software, right? You have to keep up with the latest fixes, and that's the other big issue with open source security. Um, you know, I, I, I worked on a company on app security space. Uh, there are different reports, but really more than 90% of the pu public vulnerabilities in, in open source software, uh, they already have a fix. They already have a fix. Um, here's here are a couple of numbers, uh, a couple of uh, uh, reports that were published just very recently in June, basically in the last couple of months by two companies, uh, Synopsys and Sneak. And I just wanted to share some 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 numbers, and I don't want to scare you, uh, but it, this is real, right? Uh, Synopsys going and scan and looked at more than 1,500 applications, and they found that more than 75 or 70, about 75% of those applications, 1,500 applications, had vulnerabilities. Uh, and then, you know, 49% had actually high risk, high severity uh, vulnerabilities. Um, I'm not going to talk about licensing here. I mean, it's not it's not security related, but it's it's important in open source, as you know, to to be uh, have the proper licensing. Uh, so there was also uh, uh, there's this, this important information around uh, you know some of the issues related to open source licenses, um, and then the other issue that at, that this report, um, open source security and risk analysis report uh, shows is you see this that 82 and 80, 88 percent. Uh, this is when when you use uh, libraries that haven't been touched there for four years, five years, in some cases a lot more. So uh, very important advice there. If you are starting to work with open source software, yes, look for uh, successful open source projects that they have a lot of activity. There, there's some that, you know, if no one is really touching them for years, that means that they have vulnerabilities out there that no one has really addressed, right? And then really quickly with the, the other report, uh, the state of open source security report, just, just a couple of charts there to show you. Uh, I was telling you about the the dependencies like libraries calling other libraries. Uh, it, there's a big difference depending on the programming languages. Uh, so, for example, uh, most of the vulnerabilities found on on Python are on the direct library, direct uh, dependency. Uh, whereas for Java and maybe in Central or Ruby or or for Node.js, uh, most of the vulnerabilities are found on the indirect dependencies or or the uh, transitive libraries, right? Not exactly the one that you are you're calling, but the ones that are used by those libraries. Uh, and another very important point, now that we're using containers, or a lot of people are using containers, uh, the nice thing about containers is that within the same container, you have your application, you have runtimes, and you have you can even have your Linux distribution within the container. Well, it's important to, to, to check those as well, right? They might have vulnerabilities with inside the container. And uh, part of this story went and checked some of the popular um, Kind of official container images out there in uh, Docker Hub, and I mean you can see by yourself some of the well-known 
um, open source uh, software out there that actually has significant number of vulnerabilities and you have to keep up with that, right? That's our, another reality with open source uh, security. So what is the real risk? And, and I think you get it based on, on my the previous information. Uh, it, it's really about the speed, right? So uh, once the vulnerability is disclosed, uh, the exploit becomes easier. Why? Because the bad guys have access to the same uh, Git repo out there that tells you, yeah, I just fixed this vulnerability, right? Uh, and then becomes a, a speed race, right? So you go, you have to go and 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 patch it right away, right? There's there's a fix. You have to go and uh, and patch it, and you have to go and patch also your transitive or, or dependencies. So you know that's when you are at risk, right? And I think this picture actually, uh, I, when I saw it, it's like, yeah, this this represents, right? You swim at your own risk. Uh, you're not going to go and fix 100% of the vulnerabilities because in some cases it could be hundreds or thousands. Uh, but you have to go on and address the, the high severity ones, at least the high severity ones. And as you move with the speed, right, as you are implementing or you already automating your DevOps, uh, your continuous integration, continuous deploy, uh, delivery, uh, it's important to automate. Just like you automate your testing, uh, just like you're automating your build or your, your, your the build of your apps, uh, automate security automate scans that go and identify uh, vulnerabilities. Um, I, I think that's a great opportunity there for verifying only, not only your first party code, but also the, the open source code. So that brings me to the vulnerability scanners. Uh, that's what you use to identify these vulnerabilities. In a nutshell, uh, what they are is a way to identify the open source libraries in your code and then cross-check against a database where you have the information if there are vulnerabilities or not in those uh, libraries. Um, you know, the software can also give you some information about, um, you know, the, obviously the CVEs or the scores, but also some information around alerts. You can define some thresholds, some some, some policies, and and of course recommended to be make it part of a DevOps, right? As as they call shift left, make it early as early as possible, so you have time to go and address those vulnerabilities. Uh, there's a bunch of open source software out there or, or, or just free scanners. Uh, I'm just listing a few of them, you know, just go on and do it. Let's go and implement that. Um, you know, there's a dependency checker from OWASP. There's, I mean, you can use an NPM audit or GitHub, GitLab or, or offer some, um, some free uh, scanners. And there's also the commercial products, right? The commercial products are known as uh, software composition analysis. And they offer you, uh, you know, more complete database of vulnerabilities. Uh, they offer you some other more, more functionality, right? Bill of materials, things like that. So you got this, right? Uh, you know, how do you manage your open source usage? Uh, uh, you have to have visibility of the open source usage. You have to have visibility of your risk uh, on those vulnerabilities on your open source software. And, and you know, make it automatic, automatic, right? Make it part of your CI uh, pipelines make make it from devops to DevSecOps, right um just finally uh there was there's actually part of the linux foundation a new project the open source security foundation a great initiative ogwasp is part of them and many of the other major players uh and they're going to be working on you know the vulnerability disclosure which is obviously a, a, an issue uh that i was telling you earlier that not everyone discloses, or there might be some differences on the disclosure. Uh, they're gonna be working on promoting tooling to, to help you with this open source security. So great to, to check on, on, on that. It's just very, very new. I uh, just started in the last few weeks. Uh, so finally, just, just a few thoughts for you. Um, my advice, uh, my recommendation is, you know, keep promoting open source, right? Uh, keep promoting innovation in, in your organization. Uh, if you have mainframes, uh, you are already a mainframe user, take advantage of those great uh, security features, right? You have things like, you know, perversive encryption. You 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 may, you may have these problems with open source, but if you're encrypting everything, you reduce the chances of a breach. Uh, you can have your workload iso isolation, your isolation of workloads. Uh, you know, some of the more recent functionality, I believe it's just on the Z15, the data privacy passwords. Uh, the comp compression, I mean, it's, it's amazing. I'm amazed uh, at the speed of compression available on a mainframe. Uh, and then, you know, this new feature that you probably saw it there, the homomorphic encryption, uh, sounds really good, right? So uh, you can have encryption at rest or in transit, and with homomorphic encryption, uh, you don't have to decrypt 
to provide to do some operations or, or do some of uh, the work uh, with that data or with those numbers or with, with what you have encrypted. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, process intensive, um, but you can do that with a mainframe now. So, you know, if you haven't taken a look, keep, keep an eye, check, check that. Uh, and of course, um, you know, keep uh, promoting open source within your developers. Keep an eye on, on security, educate your developers on security. Uh, keep an eye on those vulnerabilities, uh, identify them and then identify them often. So with that, I think we're going to uh, uh, a Q&A section. Thank you very much.